the opportunity to come here to the Tuesday Breakfast Forum. Um, this is a great opportunity for our office to uh, perform one of our duties, which is community outreach, to work with our citizenry, um, to ensure that everybody is aware of what is going on in the assessor's office. Uh, thank you for allowing us today and to Steve for his hard work and Terry for getting the monitor back up. So that takes a village, takes a village. Uh, my name is Ken Joyner. I am your Mecklenburg County Assessor. Um, I've been with Mecklenburg County since October of 2013. I was brought in um, in the wake of the 2011 revaluation to um, help direct and lead the county through the 20. 14 through 2017 uh, revaluation review project and then 
um, to take the county forward at that point. So we completed the last revaluation in 2019. Um, as it was said, uh, Bradley, Brad Fowler, uh, Brad is our assistant assessor over real property. So the revaluation is under his team. Uh, Brad was with us um, through the review project. He was a commercial supervisor in the office. Left there and has been in Durham County as the assistant assessor there. And also um, left there and went to Catawba County up in Hickory as the assessor in that county. Brad joined us back almost a year ago in July and um, has brought back valuable information and knowledge and leadership to the office. So we're excited to have him as part of the team as well. So we will jump on into the presentation, um, the 2023 revaluation. And again, Brad and I will both be available at the end uh, working with our facilitators to answer all of your questions. So one of the first things we're always asked is why do we do revaluations? Well, the North Carolina's general statutes say that each county must perform one at least once every eight years. Mecklenburg County, after the 2019, seeing those large shifts in values that can occur, um, as we're seeing now, even in four years, decided to advance that cycle to a four-year cycle. It helps keep those values and assessments closer to market value. Also, it allows us to keep our public more educated by doing these types of sessions. And we'll show you the number of sessions we have done so far. We put this out there a while back and you know we're not sure exactly where the market will take us on um, this last half of 2022, but it does reduce the likelihood of having an even larger value shift if you're on an eight year cycle. So the purpose of a revaluation is to provide the county with an equitable distribution of the tax base and keeping those assessments fair and equitable on a more regular basis. The property tax basis, North Carolina is set up on a system that everyone is to pay according to the value of their property. So we try to keep those at those current market levels. The most important item up here to me is that a revaluation is not a means to increase property tax revenue. And I think in 2019, we can discuss that later and identify um, how that works. Okay. You can raise that hand whenever they want to get on the, the list of questions. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, great. So where are we at? Mecklenburg County continues to grow, as everybody is probably aware by the media and everything. We're almost at 400,000 parcels, real property parcels, and probably are over that number because this was as of January 1. We're getting ready to update those in July because we've got to increase and use those new parcels and have them as part of the revaluation as well. The revaluation is a two-part system. We do an initial review across all of our parcels, across all of our market areas or neighborhoods. And in that initial pass, we've done 94% or on almost 373,000 parcels. That initial shift or that initial review is completed in two different um, sections. We have the residential that we expect to complete by July 31st, and then we can start those second reviews and determining what those final values are being. The commercial um, has a September 30th date and then a final review through the last part of the year. So pictures are a lot easier to look at. This is showing you the blue areas are the residential areas that have been completed so far. The red areas are those commercial districts. 
Right now, we're looking at a median home price on residential of almost 389,000 when you look across all of the sales. By statute, we are to be at 100% of market value. So in our initial review, our initial pass right now, when you compare the values that our system is putting on properties versus those recently sold properties, we're at about 99.6. So right there at 100% where we're supposed to be. Well, I mentioned neighborhoods and market areas. We delineate our neighborhoods to help us um, be more consistent, more fair, and more equitable in our valuations. This is probably our most important tool, dividing the county into smaller areas so that we're not valuing Pineville with Uptown. We're not valuing um, our area here near Optimus Park and this area with Cornelius or the lake. So we're using these smaller areas to establish where the sales come from to value those neighborhoods and establish what we believe is the typical value, most probable value in those areas versus having the entire county, all 400,000 parcels going into the mix on those sales. So if you're going to be doing an appraisal, you've got to have good market transactions and the market in Mecklenburg you look at what we were able to utilize in 2019, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 24,000 sales per year leading up to that revaluation. Going ahead now to 2023, you can see the sales in the year of 19, 20, and 21 have continued to go up. Um, for 2022, we've already qualified about 6,400 sales. So we, we will have the amount of market transactions necessary for us to do our appraisal work. Another important factor that I like to point out in Mecklenburg County is that our Board of Commissioners takes a step beyond what is statutorily required. We have a Citizens Review Committee. It's nine members um, appointed by the Board of Commissioners. These individuals, most of them work in real estate in some function as either appraisers, realtors, uh, we've got a, a mortgage lender on there. So they're all knowledgeable of what our office is required to do. We give them a copy of the general statutes and their purpose is they review our overall operations. We started back in March with them. We've gone over currently how we value a residential neighborhood uh, we talked about the appeal process. Uh, we've done the commercial valuation process. Uh, we've gone over our quality control and quality assurance program. We've got another program later this week. What are we doing in that? Uh, talking about basically gentrification and transitional neighborhoods. We're talking about gentrification and transitional neighborhoods with our um, citizens review committee. All important topics that need to be covered. We go over our appraisal methods. We talk about the statistics so they can see how we are working. Um, they're monitoring our progress. And eventually they will make a report to the Board of Commissioners on their findings as a committee. Communications plan. When I got here in 2013, the county had done a um, customer service um, review of 2011 and one of the most um, glaring indicators of a lack of service by the office was the lack of community outreach and I started almost immediately going out into the public and trying to discuss what our office does because every one of our customers deserves to understand what the process is so we have continued with our communication plan. Um, for 2019, we did about 220 community events. We have done, with the pandemic, the numbers are not as high, but we'll go through those later. We still have made a significant number of visits since February to committees, either virtually 
or in person or a hybrid like we have today where we have some virtual and large number of you here in person. The revaluation brochure, and we've got some of these. We'll pass these out to you. Another part of our revaluation communication plan. We worked with our public information department. It talks about some of the important functions. What is a property revaluation? It talks about the appeal process. It talks about how you can determine your property value. Another item that I think is important and we all learned during the pandemic are what a QR code is. If you scan this with your phone, it'll take you directly to our website. It has a copy of the presentation today on there. It also has um, important information about the appeals process. It also has um, information on how to utilize our website. So here are some of the presentations that we have done. You can see there were a few uh, prior to uh, February, but you can see we really kicked it up in February with a number of sessions in March and April. On through May, um, we're now into June. We're here at the Tuesday morning breakfast forum, and we've got a few more um, scheduled for June. Uh, Kay Tembo, our one of our community engagement individuals scheduled this meeting, and I can guarantee you he's emailing and calling people this morning because we will get two or three presentations a week assigned to us um, by him and his department. He's a huge partner of ours in this process. So in the news, when you start looking at what is going on here in Charlotte, we found this um, from Realtor.com, showing some of the top housing markets over 2021. And Charlotte was the number three in the nation. I can tell you, having been in the business now about 29 years, that is unusual. It's usually California, Florida, um, Texas. It's going to be Arizona, places like that typically. And they're still many of them hold there, but we are seeing unprecedented growth in our region. And again, that's what our office is required to look at and determine as we go forward with these valuations as of January 1 of 23. So we mentioned the website earlier. When you go through the QR code, and it also has our website address here, trying to make it as easy as possible, reval.mecnc.gov. When you go down there and you search for your property value, it'll bring you to this screen and you can put in your name or your address. If you know your parcel number, that's another item you can get there, but most people it's name or address. So you put that in, it's going to give you a picture of the property, um, a map looking at the property, all some important information, what is the appraised value. And then we have this line down here where you can get to additional information on your land building, the property features, value changes over history, the tax bill, neighborhood information, pictometry, which is just going to get you to a larger screen of the map, um, community information, but to me, this copper button is probably the most important one because that takes you to your neighborhood and it'll show your neighborhood and it will provide you with the sales that our office is looking at. So here's the property record card on each of the properties and then here is copper. So you can see here this grayed out area is the neighborhood that we have defined. All of these yellow dots are the sales that have taken place in that neighborhood. These are the sales that we're using. In a lot of our transitional neighborhoods, older neighborhoods, you're going to see property selling at different levels. You're going to have your newer homes, you're going to have those that have been remodeled in the last 
five to six years, you're going to have some that have never been remodeled. So it's an important feature because we may not always have your level of, of depreciation proper. We may believe that it has been remodeled when it has not. So you can look at the sales and determine which ones you believe are the most comparable. And here we selected a few properties here. It will produce a report for you where you can look at your subject property, your property, the sales price of these. It'll tell you how far they are from there. It'll talk about the square footage. There we go. So you've got the ability to compare how many baths, how many bedrooms, all of that important information for comparability. As we get into the revaluation, we appreciate everyone going out here between now and January 1. Because if you see something wrong with your property, and we've got your square footage too high, I can guarantee you we're not going to get your value correct because our physical characteristics have to be correct for our appraisal models to work. There are 400,000 parcels, as we said. We're going to have some errors. So we appreciate people letting us know. You can let us know if the square footage is wrong, the number of bedrooms and baths, all of that important information. Once the notices go out, you can save this PD as a PDF, and you can send it to our office through our online portal, which is called Modrium. We started this for 2019, and we'll be back online in the fall of 22. Through the online portal, you can send us photos of your home to show us issues that it faces. If there's a recent appraisal, you can send that to us. If you got an engineering report or something, someone has determined there's issues with your foundation. Whatever the problems are, you can provide that information to us over that portal. It'll allow you to chat back and forth with the appraiser who is working on your property. Now we do ask for patience. In 2019, we had about 25,000 of these informal. So it may take us a few weeks to get to a particular um, instant, but we try to work through those as quickly as possible, and we do try to work those in the order that they're received. So if you get one in early, we try to work through those. But we also know that not all of our communities are as tech savvy. So we still accept walk-ins. Um, back in 2019, there were a couple of neighborhoods that brought vans in with seniors and others from the neighborhood. You can walk into our office and we'll sit you down with an appraiser. It may not be the particular appraiser, but someone who can work through that property record card, gather your information, and ensure that it is uh, properly handled. We accept phone calls. Um, we are... Um, trying to get all of the different avenues. You can mail information into us. So we're trying to cover whatever is the most convenient method for each of our customers. We're also looking at the fact that in many of our communities, eight to five is a not a convenient time. So we are investigating and looking at how we can partner with some of our um, important groups around the county. We've already talked with Habitat. We're talking with Dream Key about the possibility of setting up some neighborhood meetings after the notices go out where they can host and we can be there and bring some appraisers and we can work with our customers on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Again, trying to ensure that we have um, accessible 
methods for all of our customers, all of our citizens here in Mecklenburg County. Some other things that we always like to talk about whenever we're out and about is our property tax relief programs. These are set up by the state of North Carolina. Mecklenburg County is uh, one of 100 counties and these programs are the same throughout the state. They are not high enough. I will go ahead and say that. Our board has worked with the state, with the legislature for years and not been able to get them to give this to the levels that they are needed. But if someone qualifies, our first one is our elderly or disabled exclusion. It's going to exclude either the first 25,000 of value or 50% of the total value of the parcel. In Mecklenburg County and probably throughout North Carolina, that's going to be 50% of the value in most cases, which means if you exclude half of the value, it's going to cut that tax bill in half. For someone to qualify, they must be the January 1 owner of the property, a North Carolina resident, at least 65 years or age, or totally and permanently disabled. And their income for 2021, for this year's program, last year's income had to be 31,900 or less. So again, it's not high enough. We've tried to um, push with the legislature to look at the AMI levels, to look at the size of the home, the number of people living there, things such as that, but we have not been able to successfully see those things through at this point. Our second program is a smaller program for disabled veterans. This is to assist them if they have had to make alterations to their home that could affect their value. They've had to make it more accessible because of their disability. Under this program, $45,000 of value is removed. Must be the deeded owner, January 1, North Carolina resident, 100% um, disabled and honorably discharged. There is no age or income requirement here. Again, I believe 45,000 is probably not enough at this point, but this one is more of a federal um, program in those amounts and things. So again, trying to work with a different level of government to get that information up. Again, just to recap, we are right here in our community engagement. We're working with our citizens review committee and we expect to finalize the values in that December time range, looking at sales as they are coming in throughout the remainder of the year. Once the notices are mailed in January of next year, we begin that informal review or informal appeals period where we can work one-on-one. -on -one. Formal appeals must be filed by a certain date in May. We have not finalized what that date will be, but as we get closer to January 1, we will publicize what that formal date, that appeal period ends. I can tell you that if you're still in the informal review process and we reach May, you still, once we finish that informal review and get that out, you still have an additional 30 days. So as long as you're in the pipeline, it's just the last time we had a large number of individuals that skipped the informal and went straight through the formal process. So we would love to be able to work one-on-one -on -one with everyone, but not everybody chooses that. And the first bills that will be utilizing these new values will be the bills mailed next July, July 23. This year's tax bills will still be utilizing those 2019 values. So that's our presentation. We're available for questions. He, he 
have this um, letter. Um, if someone sells their house for a stupid price, very, very low, do you take that into account when you're doing the revaluation for the area? Uh, yes, ma'am. We, we look at all transactions. As long as they are arm's length transactions and we can't identify that somebody was under some undue um, stimulus or foreclosure, things like that would exclude those sales. But if someone in a market environment sells their house, we look at all of those transactions. But we're not looking to the highest in the neighborhood or the lowest, we're looking for that most probable. So most likely, unless you have a, a series of those, they would fall down in the lower section and probably not affect the values of other properties. Okay, uh, Lisa, you used a number of acronyms. The AMI, what is that? Um, Average? Adjusted, um, Adjusted median income. Yeah. Okay, what about the uh, CAO? Uh, County Assessor's Office. I get to talk in business instead of talking normal, don't I? <laughs> what about uh, <laughs> um, That's our Board of Equalization and Review. That's the statutory board that the commissioners um, appoint members to. It's members of our community that hear the property tax appeal cases at the local level. Thank you very much, and I took all these notes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, makes me very happy. Yes. Makes me very happy. Okay. Um, Winston, we have a, a text message that came, a text question that came in from someone listening. Yes, ma'am. This is from Winston Robinson. Um, he says, with these sophisticated systems in place, what would be the reason that properties owned by black people or in largely black neighborhoods continue to be undervalued both at a city, county, and national level? I can tell you that it is part of my job and the requirements of my job to ensure that those inequities do not occur. We look at all of the market transactions within all of our neighborhoods. So we are going to try to look at those through a lens of data versus identifying any type of demographic information across any neighborhood. So I understand and I respect the question, but we are trying to use all of that data to ensure that we are fair and equitable across all of our neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, my question is, is in reference to uh, the information that you have up here, and, and how do how is this county set up to get pictures of all of the housing that in, in this in this county, in Mentor County, or across the state? How do they do that? Because there are a lot of them, and they're going they're going up every day. And how do you keep up with that? Um, we actually hire an outside vendor. Uh, we work with the county GIS department. I think there's a couple of city partners that all um, will contribute to those contracts. And they ride the streets um, and take pictures of each of the properties and provide those back to us. Their, their sophistication is they're taking multiple shots of each properties as they're driving by. Then they've got individuals that work for them that are looking for people that are in the photos and removing them or blurring them. If a license tag is showing, they blur that. Um, so that's a contracted item to do those. We are right now working um, with all of those partners to try to get those updated again because there are a lot, as you said, that have not been updated recently. So um, we try to do that on a fairly um, regular periodic basis. Great. Yeah. Um, well, when we get into the contract, they will go through all of the properties one time. 
then we will identify the areas with the largest growth, the largest changes, and over the next three to four years, they will um, hit those areas, and then we turn around and do the entire county again. Okay, um, I'll leave you up with next, and then we'll see. I know you talked about um, seniors and um, 65 and disabled, but when you go back to gentrification, I know, and I'm familiar with this in other states, where if a property has been there so long or you're a certain age, and you pass to stay status quo. Has Mecklenburg ever county especially you know, because like property goes up, but money doesn't necessarily go up. Income not at the right. same level. Right. So if you have been accustomed to paying this much, do you understand what I'm saying? Oh yes. Has Mecklenburg County ever thought about uh, implementing something like that? Well, unfortunately in North Carolina it would have to be done at the state level and it would be the same across all 100 county. Um, the Board of Commissioners do not have the authority to do that under North Carolina statute. After 2019, and we were going to talk about this one um, shortly, the City of Charlotte started an aging in place program and I'm not sure what the status of that one is, but the county started a homes program, um, helping our Mecklenburg families with economic support. It's a grant program that is through um, the Department of Resources, um, run the CRCs. Um, there's the one there in Valerie C. Woodard. They accept applications and look at those. Um, they also look to see if someone's already in the homestead or some of the other programs. And with that one, in 2019, it looked at the median home value, the amount of the increase, and things like that. And the grants were $340, up to $340 to help individuals that saw an increase due to the revaluation. That one has no age. It does have um, an income requirement, but the county, as we talked about, was able to look at um, some of the HUD information and utilize at an AMI level there um, that raised that. I want to think a family of four that qualified was up to like 58,000 or somewhere in that ballpark. So the county was able to do something there to help. And that again was to assist in those increases that individuals might be seeing. So that program is not run through my office because um, we were told by the UNC School of Government that it would probably um, make it a little more iffy. So it's a grant program run through um, basically similar to other DSS services, Health and Human Services programs. So um, that would be another great topic for one of your um, Tuesday morning forums would be to get um, those representatives and we can get y'all that information over to talk about that program. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. Um, before I ask my next question, I have two part question. Uh, the Aging in Place program has stopped accepting applications. It stopped accepting applications after 2019. Okay. Uh, they only used about 5% of the, the money that was uh, available for that particular program. Um, and that money has been shifted over to the Staying in Place program, which is dedicated to three specific neighborhoods in the city of Charlotte. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, I know that a lot of individuals with needs, when they go through the reevaluation process, they hire attorneys uh, mm -hmm. to help them through that process because it is oftentimes complex. Um, is there a, uh, has the, the assessor's office worked with legal aid organizations or other legal organizations to, per, to get individuals engaged with an attorney while they're going through the process? And is that information readily available to the public? 
Um, that's that's a that's a great great question. We are right now investigating those different um, avenues that we can do to support um, the entire community. I can tell you that we have worked with legal aid on the homestead program where they have provided professionals. We would discuss the program and then they would be there to provide assistance, um, confidential services to those individuals. So that's on our list of topics to discuss with them uh, for that point when those notices are going out to try to provide some type of program where maybe they can partner with us and Habitat and others to ensure that everybody has access to those services. So that's a great, great comment, really right up where we're at right now. We're, we're working with the School of Government at UNC Chapel Hill on an appeals study to determine um, the success rate for, across different neighborhoods during the appeals process. And that's really what we're trying to do is to determine how we can move that curve and try to ensure that everybody has just as much access and ability during that process. Great question. Thank you, uh, Tom. Yeah, my question is, like you can see a piece of property with a tax value of $31,000. Then when you inquire about the property and want to buy the property, they sell it for $450,000. So how do Mecklenburg County get their taxes. You know, this person sitting there paying thirty paying taxes of thirty one thousand dollars to sell the property for four hundred and fifty thousand right. dollars. Right. Something is wrong. <laughs> right. When when I got here in twenty thirteen, um, there was a lot of information out there as to when the last time staff had visited all of the properties. It's called field canvassing where we visit all of the properties. And the the date of 20 years or more was thrown out there. Talking to staff, um, some that have been there for 35 years said, I don't know that it's ever been undertaken. Well, starting in 2014, we started visiting all of the properties to visually put a set of eyes on every property, not just those that had building permits or changes like that. So. We're trying to clean up that database as much as possible. In the last eight years, we visited all but about four or 5,000 parcels, 4,000 the last time I was looking at the numbers. So we're hoping by January 1 that we can say we have visited all of those properties because we know that's a problem too. We run into, when I first got here, it was not uncommon for Parks and Rec to be um, talking with someone about purchasing properties to include in the Greenway and other things. And the assessed values were pennies on the dollar. So we made a, a, what I believe to be a huge increase in that in 2019. And every revaluation we look to improve that process. Great question. Okay, um, and this kind of goes right into what you just said. Uh, we have a question from Campbell, she's asking, uh, on virtual, and she's asking, how will putting Greenways in Far East Neighborhood um, Coalition help property values? Well, as an appraiser, our office is reactive in that process. We're not making assumptions when items are done that they're going to increase values. We look at the sales that have occurred. So if the market transitions and starts showing that those properties are more valuable because access to the Greenway, those sales will show us that in our data. So um, it's, it's much like gentrification. We're not out in front of that process. We are looking at what buyers and sellers in a market are doing and, and following those trends and coming up with our values based on what has occurred instead of what we believe could occur. Okay, I have a question, um, and you answered one, you just answered one part of it. Um, I was asking, I wanted to ask you, how does uh, gentrification uh, affect the original homeowners 
in the neighborhood and well, all of a sudden, I mean, you've got, you got 1,100 square foot little house and then somebody comes in and builds a huge three-story $800,000 house. How, what about that person? How does that affect that person? Um, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the appeals process and ensuring that our information is correct on the houses that are there. When those properties are selling, in most cases, you see someone buying that property and the house is demolished and then a new home is built. You know, that's typically what we're seeing in a lot of these areas where the gentrification is occurring. We look at those original sales, those are establishing the new land values in the neighborhood because they determine that the land under that home is more valuable than the home that exists. So that ends up being um, that land value. Then we do studies to look at what is the typical size home that is being demolished. So if an 11 square foot home is being demolished multiple times, those that own 1,100 square foot homes or less may have no value to their home. It may just be the value of that land. If there are larger homes in those neighborhoods, there may be a percentage of their value because it wouldn't be the full home value. If they're at 2,000 square feet, our study would look at and indicate what percentage of that value would remain. We also need to ensure that we have um, good, accurate information on the level of depreciation of the homes that are still um, having some value. And that's where pictures of the interior, um, if you know that there's issues that need to be taken care of in the home, all of that information is invaluable to us as we're going through that appraisal and trying to ensure that we get that value um, to its correct market levels. Okay, um, so what you're saying is that the 1,100 square foot house the land under it is more, more valuable than the house. Well, that's what the market is showing. But right. that's the level that you're starting to see. And, and you see it in many of the neighborhoods where um, the larger homes are the last ones to um, be bought and mm -hmm. torn down. They usually start with the smaller ones. So it, it's, it's where that value of the land to the, to the buyer side of the um, market has said, we we now are willing to purchase this home just for the land under it. So the person who owns a home really needs to up their price. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's it's important to be a knowledgeable seller right. and not right. just accept what these letters that are coming out or mm -hmm. somebody knocking on your door. They're not there to help you. Mm -hmm. So you need to know that. That's important. Um, and then the other thing was that when you were showing the, the home, you gave some examples of some homes and you used uh, communities. Can you show us an example of one of the neighborhoods on the west side? Um, well, it's not in the PowerPoint. Um, I don't know if Steve can get us internet access to where we could pull something up, but I'm sure that we could pull up a neighborhood I, over here. I, I'm just saying that because of the relevance to the Oh, I understand. You know, I understand. Uh, because most of the people are not like, living in the drop the, homes that drop the power around power. here. You can um, escape. Okay. So, Laura, my question is uh, you, sh you share with us your schedule uh, that you, where you would be doing a presentation. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this is a predominant, predominant uh, it's a diversity, but it's predominantly black. And we try to disseminate information, particularly to that. But I didn't see where a lot of organizations or presentations were in the process of being presented to other groups in our communities. Do you have those people? Or have you reached out to some of the other organizations? Because there are several different organizations on the west side just itself, but there are other uh, communities that I think, and groups that will probably want to be aware of this information. So do you have them on your list at some point? Or? We will. We're working with all of those groups. Um, 
you know, the historic this west side, large. we met with that larger neighborhood group back in 2019. And every time I speak to Kay and give him some other it's groups, block. we no, can get those from no, him today. Uh, most, in most cases, he's already communicating <laughs> with them. The problem is, is that many of those groups have their meetings scheduled out to a certain point. So we're trying to get all those as quick as possible. But yeah, we'll take any neighborhoods that you've got that you feel are important now. and uh, we'll get those to K. Okay, and I'm, and, and, and I'm just, how, how did you find out about the Um, K found out about it. Okay, okay. Yeah. I believe so. He's got the entire list of the 220 that we visited the last time. Um, but Kay, when we established this one, he told us that this was a very important meeting um, with a lot of knowledgeable people here in this community here. So he, he does a really good job of um, talking to city partners, um, to other groups, to ensure that we're getting to the places that we need to be. Can I piggyback on what Laura said? Because that was my question, Laura. Um, basically, what I have found in having conversation, even with United Way, I don't think the groups that we're talking about, Laura, are currently on the list. It's unfortunate, the neighborhoods, because my question was the attendance of this meeting, so where are these meetings and the zip codes that people that look like me live in? Mm -hmm. And I didn't see it on there either. So, you know, just like I think other people pick our meters, I think other people have identified it as the main status quo where we live. And I don't believe that, um, I think this, you know, I wasn't excited about this presentation. This was a great presentation. And other people deserve that opportunity. Yes, and I don't think that they do. I, I, what is your method of communication? How is it being communicated? Because I too like Laura feels that there are groups on the I can just say one zip code, two eight two one six two eight two oh six two, you know, that deserve this tell you that in 2019 we had we look we established across the commissioner districts and um, we had more presentations I want to think in district 2 which was Miss Leak's district than we did in the other so the fact that we may not have hit as many right now it is a focus for us because we want to make sure, uh, much like he said, a lot of the neighborhoods already know about revaluation and they've already talked to an appraiser or an attorney and trying to figure out what their best course of action is. So it is it is incumbent upon us to get that information out. We can that's promise what, make sure make sure y'all do it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love this week. I love this week. And district three is along uh, Bates Road. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Tom. Yeah, uh, I've, I've noticed like with gentrification, you you can have a property like Savannah Avenue. Uh, the property value was one thing when black people lived on Savannah Avenue. Then when they stopped gentrifying, the property value went up. I was, I need the same property. Well, why? Why? Because the white person moved on the street, or uh, uh, Chinese moved on the street. That property value go up when it's when it's, it's the same property. Right. Well, and and again, in 2019, that was my first revaluation here. 
we are not looking at color. We're just looking at the data and what those sales and those transactions are. I, again, this is a comment I've heard many times going back to 2013, and I made the commitment to individuals back then that those values are going to be established based on market transactions. We're not using any technique that's going to hold values back for any group because everyone under our system deserves to be at that market value, and the system is not fair if everybody's not paying at that market value. Okay, Natalie. I just see they are selling for more than their assessed value, according to what I hear in the news. People are coming in with a barrel full of cash and are paying above assessed value for their house. And from what I hear in the news, that's happening quite often. And you're doing the assessment based upon those values at this time. This is not going to continue. So loan assume a lot of those house values are going to go down next year or the year after. How does that affect the property taxes that are going to be paid based on an assessment when the prices are in place? Well, again, from a data standpoint, the our market and and appraisal is all about a willing buyer and a willing seller. So if someone comes in with an amount of cash and somebody accepts it, that is a data point, that is a market transaction. In 2019, those values have held until January 1 of 23. So as the values have increased, the amount of which the distribution of the property taxes has stayed the same. When we do the revaluation in 23, they will stay the same until 2027 when we look at what the market uh, values are at that point. So if the market were to go down um, in 23, 24, or 25, those would be reflected in those values for January 1 of 27. Okay, this young lady, Hi. Uh, Hi. Uh, my name's Kylie Marsh. Um, so you've spoken a lot about uh, the CAO's uh, like work toward equity, um, but I think it's important to recognize that when these these neighborhoods were set up, they were undervalued specifically because of the people that lived here, right? So that market price or whatever still has that information baked in. So I'm wondering what the role is of the CAO um, to actually make steps toward because that because people may may have this information and know the actual market value of their, their house but at the same time is that information available so that people can sell them and get the actual value because that doesn't end displacement and displacement is happening so i need to know what what your role what the cao's office role is or if, if that's not your your place then who in the city or county government can actually work right. to acknowledge those things. Right. Um, as the county assessor, my role is to ensure that values are at those market levels based on the market as of the years leading into the revaluation. We're going to put more weight on sales in 2022 than we would in 2020 or 2021 because we're closer to that date the more, the more likely it is of what the current market is. Um, very valid points. I think that those are items that fall under both the city and the county, um, whether it's um, affordable housing or, or community relations or other programs like that. Those other topics are, are very important but they really don't factor into where we're at in the market today. You know, I think that those are, are items that really kind of start with our elected officials and, and becoming priorities for our community to ensure that they get the um, necessary look at and understanding that they need. Um, my question is in reference to your 
advisory board board of uh, review. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us any African Americans that have ever been on that board? Do you know? Uh, uh, there's nine not total, nine, nine total on the board. Um, I know that there is Oh, I know there's more than one. Okay. I'm, just, I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to think. Um, Brad's pulling up the names. I think. I think we can even get you a list of the the names of individuals on the committee because that would be public record. But I, I want to think that there are um, two, two of the nine. Two of the nine. Because there's the one gentleman up near Huntersville um, that was at our town meeting up there. I know the gentleman that's a realtor um, that I believe is, um, I want to think somewhere in this area. Because I want to think I heard him say that he was in uh, Commissioner Gerald's district. So, um, I can't get nothing, nothing works. Nothing We'll get you that list, but I know of two off the top of my head, and there may be a third. And they, if they you know, and they are appointed by the uh, commissioners. Mm -hmm. Is there, I know we have applications for, that are out here and available for those that are interested in serving on the board. Is that one that is, uh, that they have an application for you to apply for? It is, and um, I know that. I know that Commissioner Leak was a part of the interview process for those appointments. Um, I sat on those interview panels as well. And there were there were trying to make it as diverse as possible was a, was a major goal in that process. And we actually delayed appointing them in January and J um, Kay made a huge outreach through the city and some of their voices in the communities to try to get as um, many good applicants. The commissioners were asked to reach out to areas and try to get um, some good committee members. So the, the idea is, is to have people across all of the districts and representing the entire community. I saw that listed, uh, but the caveat there is that you really need to do either in real estate or have some um, More experience data. in Housing, housing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the crazy and, and stuff like that. Right. But right. we have lots of African Americans that fit that criteria. Oh, yes, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've had um, two more questions here. Tommy and then uh, Yeah. Uh, in Charlotte, we have a lot of corporations buying large, uh, a lot of houses. Is, is there anything you can do about that? Because they're inflating the prices of housing in Nicolbert County. Again, um, the Board of Commissioners and County Administration have made that a priority to do some investigations into that. Um, I'm not aware of anything. I think it really um, has to start at the ground level in the neighborhood um, and the restricted covenants or things that they can put in there because I don't think government can really step into the market. Two. 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 Okay. Okay. So, if the numbers input into these like appraisal mechanisms are generated from a system that's known to be biased towards black people, I'm gonna say it. I don't know everybody don't want to say, it. but towards <laughs> black people, not people of color, black people. How will the data reflect anything other than the same? Like, how is that going to be different? Well, the, the system is not inherently biased. Um, you know, that's part of our process as, as humans where we bring bias into the system. The system. The humans made the system. So, I understand. Bias. I understand. And, you know, we establish the neighborhoods and we look at those transactions within those neighborhoods. We're not looking at sales from other areas and pulling those in. So we try to take the bias out of the process as much as humanly possible. How? Because if you know these neighborhoods are predominantly black, how 
even if you're looking at the numbers, the numbers are coming from these neighborhoods that are predominantly black. This data is coming from right. predominantly black neighborhoods. How can you take that out? Uh, you can't take it out of that because we have to go by what market transactions or sales that are occurring in those neighborhoods. We can't, as we said earlier, we can't assume where values are going to go. We have to be more reactive and looking at what has occurred in that most recent past. So the sales that are occurring right now and leading up to January 1 of 23 are the only transactions that we can look at that haven't already occurred going back to 2020 and 2021. But historically, and not even historically currently, housing, like depending on who's in the housing, affects the house price. So even if all of the work is done, it, it depends on if the black person owns the house, it's sold for lower. How can you get um, appraisals that's you know, off the board, if that's the case? Well, I can, I can tell you, I don't do single property appraisals, um, like bank appraisals and things like that. I, I work under a different standard five and six, but I instruct um, appraisers throughout the country at times on the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. The Appraisal Foundation, in a reactive measure, has made it an emphasis um, that appraisers, because of the, the bad appraisers out there, the circumstances where you see an appraiser go out, they show up at a house, someone of color is there, then someone else is hired to go out there and it's, it's a different person at the door and the values are different. They are really looking at um, disciplinary action and taking away licenses for individuals that are doing those types of practices. So again, it's it's a reactive, there's no doubt about it, but that, that banking world, the appraisals that are coming in, the federal level is trying to ensure that those are going to be as equitable as possible moving forward. But I, I, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. It's just at this point, under the statutes and what our office is required to do, we can only evaluate the transactions that occur. Okay, I know there's time, but I want to ask you something first. Um, I'm going back to that 1100 square foot house that was built in 1965. Um, expensive house. Okay, so why did the property value go up? Why did the property value go up of which property? Oh, 1100. Uh, well, first, is it based on the price of the houses in the neighborhood? Or? The sales of transactions sales. within the neighborhood, again, for the homes that existed we would be more looking at those sales of the teardowns to help establish the new land value in the neighborhood. Oh, okay. And then, so everybody's land value across the neighborhood should be consistent. Oh, okay. So we're, we try to get that consistency on the land value. Then we have to determine if an existing home has, you know, because not every property is available for sale. But if it were on the market and sold, at the size that it is, is it at the level of the homes that have been torn down or less, or is it larger and we have to determine what percentage of that improvement still adds value to that new land value? Well, I think your cow is next. You can uh, I, I was going to talk about the appraisal issues. There's specifically the black individuals and mm -hmm. how appraisers devalue homes if it's a black person. Um, but then, you know, you, you technically brought it up. I wanted to just make a comment about, you know, penalties and terminations for appraisers that are problematic in this regard or racist um, in this regard. I don't think are necessarily effective. My, my partner is a banker and he has noted that even getting an appeal of an appraisal or getting another appraiser to come out to do that process 
is incredibly difficult, and so that individual who is subject to that racist act is still stuck with that appraisal that devalues their home. So I would encourage your office or the county um, and all of us to advocate for some form of um, appeals program or, yeah. or ability to have another appraiser come out to a particular home. I, you know, I personally sold a home 20 years ago and again, I was teaching appraisal courses, teaching the standards and I knew that the appraiser didn't follow the standards because he used a cell that did not go through a realtor without making any type of an adjustment to the fact that this house sold without a 6% commission. And I appealed that to the bank. All they would do is call the appraiser. The appraiser said, that's my opinion of value, forget it. So yeah, there, there really is no appeals process without someone going through the expense of hiring another appraiser and really not even letting anybody know that it's on a property that's just been appraised and that they're looking. Uh, trying to go through that process is, is very cumbersome. And, and I would agree, the people in here have as much power as anybody to make change. It's always been that way. So. It's like the elderly exemption. My board of commissioners can tell the local delegation what needs to be done, but without getting that information out to our neighborhood and the people that are living on the 34,000 but can't qualify because they make $300 a month more in Social Security than would qualify for, the local delegation, you know, they're just our board's another vote, so it's, it's getting to that groundswell where these types of changes occur. Okay, um, yeah. Carlinia, and, this, and we get we agree. Please. Well, I to 
make it more affordable for um, our more senior um, groups in our, in our county. So again, those changes can be done at the county level. They have to be done at the state level. Okay, good to jump in. Yeah, um, so I am curious about the type of briefing for the assessors that happens on the base on the basis of a social history. Um, like we've talked a lot about how there, there is racism baked in, into real estate and property values. Um, and I want to know, is that something that is talked about at all in your office or? Uh, yes, we, um, we just went through some training, um, not only um, on the appraisal side where it's discussed and we just made the decision that we were going to put our entire appraisal staff through those discussions on some of the stuff happening at the federal level. Um, but the county has a um, diversity and equity inclusion program um, to look at how we can ensure that jobs are going to the, the right people um, and not just going based on historical methods and trying to ensure that we look through an equity lens um, at much of our um, work in, in the county. So, yeah, we, we've gone through multiple levels of training on that. Um, I can tell you that our international organization um, is going through a lot of DEI training as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and, and to follow that up, we're, we're also scheduled actually at that international organization to speak to some of the very things that you're asking about in August, matter of fact. And our appeal uh, study. Yeah, on our appeal study and the bias related therein. One thing I wanted to say, because it, it happened earlier, it was talked about earlier with, with Kyle, is it? Uh, in asking about or talking about the appeals and, and it was said about the attorneys and that sort of thing. I want to make it clear because we have people outside of this room who are watching live or on video later. That appeals process, the informal and especially the Board of Equalization and Review, there is no attorney requirement, or anything like that. So I just want to make that clear so anyone doesn't feel like that it's a cumbersome process that they're going to have to, to go through. We will help guide folks through that if they feel their property value is in error or any way that we can assist to correct their property record. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, that's great, 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 great. So we definitely thank you for giving us lots of great information.